verse 13. And uh, the New American Standard translation says, I have written to you these things who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, several months ago, I uh, knew that I wanted to share uh, some things about this. Uh, and uh, today is uh, kind of where we are on the process. So uh, for those of you who are first timers, we've been following a, a general theme all summer uh, of ordinary people encountering or confronting an extraordinary God. Uh, the thing that really spoke to my heart when Joanne and I first drove in this year to Greer back in mid-May was the blessing that God has given the two of us to be a part of sharing with you every summer. And I say every summer, at least for two summers in a row now. And hopefully uh, you want us back next year because I'd hate to think about trying to move that fifth wheeler without a truck. And uh, so uh, we do hope, we do plan to come back if it's okay with you. But the, uh, you know, John makes this amazing. Uh, well, what I started to say is that when we drove in, I thought, you know, we have people from so many different backgrounds. We have people from uh, the utility companies. We have people who are doctors. We have uh, judges. We have uh, uh, we have uh, homemakers. We have former school teachers. I mean, there, we just come from so many different backgrounds. Some of you are are like I am. You're kind of a hit from the Clay County, Illinois type of person, you know. Joanne, uh, you know where I grew up with clay between my toes. She grew up in Tucson with sand between hers. And uh, so we have this, you know, and, but as I look at the whole group, I realize whatever our backgrounds are, whatever our economic status may be, and whatever our denominational backgrounds, we all have one thing in common. We're common. <laughs> We're just ordinary people. But the amazing thing about it is that we know and worship an extraordinary God who looks at us and says, wow, good people, I love them, you know. And uh, this is really, I think, the theme that we follow throughout the summer is just common ordinary folks like you and me. We have the opportunity of knowing a God who is absolutely astounding. And we can know him, not just know about him intellectually, not just believe in him intellectually, but we can know him personally because he's made a way of that happening through his son, Jesus Christ. And so we've talked about this, and we've talked about a lot of different things, like we look at the wrath of God as in contrast to the sinfulness of man. And then we looked at the love of God in contrast to sinful man, and we compared that to the way, a, the way a jeweler displays diamonds. He throws the diamonds not out on the glass counter where you can hardly see them, but he gives you a contrast by laying them out on a piece of black velvet. And it's the blackness of the velvet that causes the brilliance of the diamonds to shine. And so as we looked at our sin, and we spent two Sundays talking, or three Sundays, I think, talking about sin, and I still can't get over how many people came up to me and told me about how much they enjoyed me talking about sin. I, it just still gets me. I've never been really excited about uh, talking about sin, particularly my own. And, and then we talked about the grace of God. And last week, in fact, we discussed this area. And so today we come to a, a pivotal time, I think, in our summer. And that is... Dealing with the issue that a lot of people struggle with, and that is having absolute assurance and confidence that they truly do have a personal relationship with God. Because we come from so many different church backgrounds, we have been exposed to a variety of teachings on whether or not we can know God in a personal way, and whether or not we can have assurance that we actually know Him, and that we have an eternal life. And this is something of what John, as, as Larry mentioned in his little comments about the Scripture, about this particular book. 
there were a lot of people that had a lot of different opinions about this, even back in the early days, within the 30 or 40 years of the resurrection of Christ, there were still people that were saying Christ had not risen from the dead. There were still people who were saying that you cannot, uh, you cannot know God without going through a particular regimen and routine and certain rituals, and as, as Ray mentioned about the different types of uh, offerings that were given in Old Testament days. And so John deals with this as he comes near. He begins the, the first part of the book. It's one of my favorite uh, pa uh, passages in the Bible. He talks about the fact that it's possible for us. Is this too loud? No. Or is it just me? We're okay. All right. I, it's okay, Larry, I think. But he talks about the idea that it's possible for you and me, common ordinary people, to have fellowship with God. And this is what he discusses in the first chapter. And he talks about this idea of loving others. And he says, if we, uh, if we walk in the light, in chapter 2, as he's in the light, we have fellowship with Him, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all, all sin. And then he goes on and talks about how because of the fact that we can have a relationship and a fellowship with God, that we also can have this same incredible relationship and fellowship with each other. So that even though we come from so many different church backgrounds, and perhaps even no church background, yet there's this commonality, that's common denominator that can bring us together, and that is a personal faith in Jesus Christ where we have received his eternal life. So John makes this comment in the fifth chapter. He says, I, I write to you, my little children. You could always tell that it was John who wrote one of these epistles. And of course, he wrote the Gospel of John and also the three epistles that we have, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. But he uses that phrase, my little children. Now, why did he use this? Well, you know, if you go back and read in the Gospel of John, you find a little secret. There's when, when you have the, the story of the Passover, there's a statement that John makes in there where he says, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, Jesus loved all of his disciples. But it becomes clear because John was one of the very first disciples to be, that Jesus called. After he announced his ministry, his public ministry in Nazareth in the synagogue, then he starts calling his disciples, and James and John were two of the first ones that he called. They were brothers, James and John. And so John, from the very beginning, has some kind of a close affinity with Jesus Christ that some of the other disciples didn't have. In fact, when you look at the, the structure of the 12 disciples, you may not have ever noticed this or not, but you'll find that they, 12 of them were divided up into four groups, and are into three groups of four, and the, the three guys that seemed to be the leaders of each of these groups were Peter, James, and John. And so John had this deep, deep, deep intimate relationship with Jesus Christ that went much deeper than perhaps some of the other disciples early on. And so when he comes to say something like this, he says, my little children. And he ended up being one of the first pastors and pastor in Ephesus. In fact, the story, the tradition is that after John was released from the island of Patmos, Patmos he's about 95 years old, something like that, that he went back to Ephesus and he went and continued to pastor that church. And it got to the point where he was so weak that he couldn't stand up by himself. And some of the men in the church would come and lift him up and bring him up and sit him down. But he always talked to the people by calling them my little children. Isn't that great? You talk about a pastor's heart. Uh, I don't know. I've called my people a lot of things over the years that I've uh, been a pastor. Some which do not bear repeating. Uh, but I don't know that I ever called anyone my little children. <laughs> but he says this, and then he says, I'm writing. I'm writing this so that you will know that you have eternal life. Now, I don't know how you are, what your experience has been, but I've run across a lot of people who believe in God and believe in Jesus Christ. Believe that He died for their sins. Believe that He rose again. Believe that He's coming back. And yet they don't have that kind of assurance. Isn't that interesting? You would think 
because we know that God never lies, cannot lie, it's totally out of his character to do that. You would think that when he says something to us, we'd accept it and believe it. And yet there are many people that have doubts about that. I don't know if I told this to you or if I just mentioned it in a private conversation with someone, but a number of years ago, uh, my father and I were doing a Bible conference in a church in Independence, Missouri. And my dad would preach at night, and I would, and then we both did the music because he was a musician as I was, as I am, I suppose. And uh, then I was doing a Bible study from 1 John uh, in the morning. We would have a morning study with mostly senior adults, people 45, 50 and older. And so when I was talking about this, one of the ladies who incidentally happened to have been my secretary many years earlier in Wichita, Kansas, right after I finished seminary, and she was in that church, served as my secretary, and she came up to me after my Bible study from, the, from 1 John, and she said, uh, I don't have, and I've always struggled with assurance of my salvation. And I thought their primary doctrine was, quote, once saved, always saved. You've heard that phrase before. And uh, yet she was struggling after all these years with whether or not she had a true, genuine relationship with the Lord. Well, she was uh, asking a question that a very outstanding intellectual of Jesus' day came and asked him one day. He said, uh, I know you're a really good teacher, but I have a question I'd like to ask. What do I have to do to guarantee that I inherit eternal life? You know the story. It's the story of Nicodemus. And Jesus said, this is how you do it. You believe in me. And then he went on, of course, and said the most famous verse of Scripture in the Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in, commits himself to, rolls over on him, will never perish. Never. The word never is there but will have eternal life. When a person is born into a physical family, sometimes we end up with birthmarks. Does anybody here have a birthmark? That I mean, that not that you would show us, sometimes they're not in the right place, but at least it is visible to you. Anybody? Okay, several of you do. Uh, I don't, and I'm not sure how that happened. But the one thing that we all have in common is we do have the genetic birthmarks of our parents. We're going. You know, my beautiful eyes and long eyelashes come from my dad. My nose comes from my mother. My tender heart comes from my well. Um, you understand what I'm saying? And so it is with a person who has been born again. You know, Jesus makes this amazing statement. He says, you know, you have to be born not only of water, and he's referring, referring to physical water. He's referring to physical birth. Because when a baby is born, the sack breaks and water comes out. So he's not talking, as many, some people think, that he's not talking about baptism. He's talking about physical birth. So he says you have to be born of water, physically, but you also have to be born of the Spirit. So there's two parts. And he says, we are born physically with certain characteristics of our parents. And when you are born spiritually, you're also going to be born with certain spiritual characteristics. And so I call those birthmarks. There was a Norwegian Lutheran, and we have several Lutherans in our fellowship here, and one of the most famous missionaries that the Lutheran Church ever had was a lady from Norway whose name was Marie Munson, M-O-N-S-O-N. -S -S 
And uh, she wrote a, a book on your relationship with Christ. And some of the missionaries from my background were missionaries in China back in the 1920s and the late teens at the same time that she was a missionary to China. And she had this interesting conversation or interesting means by which she would start a conversation. And it didn't matter whether you were a missionary or a bum in the streets, she asked the same question. Have you been born again? Well, that's an interesting question. It's a good question. It's a question that all of us need to be asked. Have you been born again? Well, I remember Dr. Culpepper, who was one of our missionaries and a long time a friend who uh, we have had in our home on numerous occasions, much older than I uh, than than we were. And uh, Dr. Culper, Culpepper told the story of when Miss Munson asked him that question, and he was almost offended. He said, "Good grief, I'm a missionary." And her response was, so, have you been born again? You see. Well, if the question was yes, I have been, or the answer was yes, I've been born again, then her second question always was, well, then have you been filled with the Spirit? You know. So he never let anybody, or she never let anybody get off easy. But here's the question, and here's the issue that we have to deal with. And that is that there are evidences in the life of a person who has been born again. And you'll see in your little note sheet today that there are four classifications or four areas that I think are interesting. There are internal evidences or birthmarks. There are external birthmarks. There are paternal birthmarks, like father, like son. And there are fraternal birthmarks. Now, obviously, I don't have time to even cover the first one adequately today. That's why you have a note sheet for yourself, so you can take it home and look at it. But today, we're going to focus on this internal evidence. What is it that inside me assures me that I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and that it is more than just intellectual understanding or intellectual acknowledgement that Jesus is real, that He is the Son of God, so forth and so on. Because you see, to know all of those things intellectually or even emotionally is not adequate. It's just like the idea of marriage. You and I can believe in marriage and yet not be married. Not to each other, I don't mean, but you understand what I'm saying. You can even fall in love with the person that you're thinking about marrying. And you can not only say, I think that would be a great person to be married to. You can even come to the point where you say, not only do I believe that would be a great person to be married to, but I want to be married to that person. But you're still not married. And as my father used to say, it's not until you come down to the altar in front of a minister or a justice of the peace and he says, wilt thou and you wilt that you're married. <laughs> so you see, it takes a decision on our part. It's like I've said before, when does the gift become yours? When it's offered to you or when you accept it? It's for you from the very beginning. But it's not yours until you receive it. This is why John said in first in John 1 12 in the Gospel of John, he says, as many as receive him, to them he gave the right to be called the children of God because they believe on his name. So what are some of the internal evidences that will assure me that I have a true personal relationship with Jesus Christ? I think you could take those and categorize them maybe into three areas. There is the evidence of His presence in your life. There's the evidence of your growth as a follower of Christ. And then there is the assurance that He Himself gives to you that you are truly a follower of Jesus Christ. You are born again. And because you have accepted Christ, you have eternal life. So it should not be necessary for any of us to leave this room today without knowing one way or the other 
yes, I am truly a follower of Christ, or no, I'm not actually a follower of Christ. So let's just look at some of these scriptures. And you'll notice, of course, and you who are regulars know that I love to do word studies on the original languages, the Greek, the Hebrew, and the Greek, and the Aramaic. So I'm not going to take time to go into all of those, but I want you to pay attention when you get home to the literal definition of some of the words that are in these scriptures. Now, in the area of the presence of a new nature, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, of course, Paul makes this astounding statement. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. And you see the definitions of, those, of some of those words there. And the idea of it being new as versus old, basically it is a never before used quality or never before used nature. This is a nature that was not a part of you from the very beginning. It was not part of your DNA. But now, because you are in Christ, and new. Not a remodel job, not a makeover, but a new creation. And the old part of you, that primeval, the original you, is gone. You say, well, if he's gone, then i got a problem because he keeps showing up every once in a while. <laughs> well, we don't have time to get into that today. But let me just tell you that, well, it's, it's kind of like I heard a guy say one time, he was actually driving his car across uh, through the Papago Indian Reservation over here outside of Florence, taking that shortcut up to Phoenix. It's either Florence or Coolidge, I can't remember which way that cutoff goes. Anyway, he stopped. And he had been a missionary in that area many years ago, and so he met one of the men that he had led to Christ. And, and he asked him, uh, how are you doing as a, as a Christian? And, and the, the Papago brave or brother said, well, it's kind of like these two dogs. A black dog and a white dog. Some of you have heard this story, or variation of it, perhaps. And he says, they're constantly fighting with each other. Sometimes the black dog wins, sometimes the white dog wins. And so the missionary said, well, which one usually wins? And the Indian said to him, the one I feed the most. <laughs> well, that's the description of the battle we have. In fact, Paul, after more than 25 years as one of the greatest missionaries of, uh, in the history of the world, wrote the seventh chapter of Romans. And beginning in verse 15, he says, I don't understand myself at all. He says, the things that I ought to do, I don't do. And the things that I know I don't want to do and I shouldn't do, I end up doing them anyway. And he concludes that, and I've already shared this this summer with you. He says, O wretched man that I am, next to the last verse in chapter 7, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body in this death? And then he answers his own question and says, I thank God it has already been done through Jesus Christ his Son, chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Aren't you glad? If you put your faith in Christ, God is not condemning you when you mess up. Why? Because you're his child. You're his. And if you think that you can forgive your children, your earthly children, when they foul up their lives and they mess up and they disappoint you or they disobey you, just imagine the grace of God that it takes for Him to do that for us. And that that's exactly what He does. But we have this reality of the presence of Christ in our lives because we are a new creation. In John 14, 23, Jesus says, If anyone loves me, He'll keep my commandments, my words, and we will come and abide in Him. And He in us. So we have not only this amazing promise that Christ will forgive us, but He'll come and live within us in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And then if you were to go on job down, you see, 
And, and the word for make, I just wanted to point this out, basically means that the Holy Spirit comes and lives in our lives and creatively produces His very presence in us. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, I think it is, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. The King James says earthen vessels. The word literally means clay pots. We have this treasure in clay pots. Some of them are cracked. So that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of man. You see, if you were not a clay pot, but you were instead a beautiful antique vase or vase, if you're the upper echelon of the culture, you would take pride in the fact that look at me and look what somebody put inside of me. Aren't I wonderful? He saw so much value in me that he thought there is no more beautiful place to put that treasure than in that pot, in that vase. No. But what he did is he made us all clay pots. In order to make sure that we do not take the credit nor the glory for anything that God has done in our lives. So as a result, we have this amazing presence, He in us and we in Him. 1 John 2.29 If you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of Him. And then one verse that you want to jot down that I failed to put in the note sheet, and that is Romans 8.16. Romans 8.16 says this, The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So you see, there is this internal presence that assures us of our salvation. Now I want you to think about the things that you think about. Have you noticed that particularly the older you get, you seem to think less and less about material things and what's going on in the world around you, and you start thinking more about moral issues, spiritual issues, and the future? Why is that? Well, it's because of the process that is the next process we see, and that is the growth process. Because it is this ongoing likeness. We are constantly in the process of being shaped and molded. It's just into, into the likeness of Christ. It's just like uh, your children. Your children didn't get, get the act all together when they were young. And, and, and it's the same way with you and me. We, may, we can be born into God's family instantaneously at a particular time in our lives and then it takes the rest of our lives for us to grow up. Just like your kids and my kids. And some sometimes never do. <laughs> John 14, verses 21 to 23. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. This is a description of where Jesus Christ, through our obedience and our faith in him, he progressively helps us grow and develop and nurture as we go through life. And then in Romans 10, 9 and 10, we find this statement. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart, the person believes. And with the mouth, confession is made to salvation. The idea is that it's a willful abandonment, abandonment of myself on a day-to-day -day basis that helps me grow. Now look, if you are not a follower of Christ, then why would you want to be more like Him? I mean, just, just practical common sense. So the very fact that there is something in you, well, let me, let's just be very practical and honest. The very fact that you're here today and that you who come up here every summer to get away from the heat Take time out of your fishing and your hiking and your all whatever else you do to schedule 
to come and meet together in God's house with God's people every Sunday. Do you think that would be something you would want if you were not a follower of Christ? No. Now, you, some of you might come just because it's a habit, it's a ritual, it's a tradition. Or some of you might come because you want to impress people and make people think you're religious. But the bulk of us are here not because we feel obligated to be here, but we're here because we want to be. Why then do we want to be? Because I have received Christ. And He's the one that draws me and helps me grow. Then our time is getting away from us. Let me just talk briefly about the third area. And that is the increased confidence that what God promises He does. The assurance that we have. Listen to what He says. John 10, this is one of my favorite studies because I love my uncle and my grandfather both raised sheep among other things. And I used to watch them. When I was just a little tiny kid, I'd go out with my grandfather when it came time to feed the sheep. And he would come up to the gate, to the pasture where all the sheep were out grazing. And he would go out on that gate and he had a bucket of oats or wheat or some whatever grain it was. And he had a stick in his hand. And he'd raise that bucket up, set it up on the edge of the gate, and he would pound on that bucket with that stick. And he'd say, come on, blabbers, come on, blabbers. And those sheep could be in the far corner of that 10-acre field, and they'd turn around and come running. The sheep knew his voice. When I would do that, and I watched my grandfather do that, and I was about four years old, I remember climbing, getting a hold of that empty bucket and that stick that he had out there in the barn, and I drug that thing over to that fence and that gate, and I climbed up on that gate as high as I could and set that bucket up on there, and I started banging on that stick saying, Come on, Blevers! Come on, Blevers! They looked at me and turned around and went back to eat. Because <laughs> the sheep did not hear my voice and recognize it. You see, there, one of the assurances that we have is the promise that Jesus made here. He says, My sheep... Hear my voice. Sheep that are not my sheep don't recognize and respond to my voice. But my sheep hear my voice. So if I find this pull, something pulling me, it's because I'm one of his sheep. Otherwise, I have no need or interest in going to a hireling, to a stranger, to a thief, or to any other shepherd. And this is what Jesus talks about in the 10th chapter of John. And then this verse that I mentioned earlier also applies here, and that is the assurance we have in Romans 8, 16. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. And then 1 John 5, 4. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. But this is the victory that overcomes the world. Our constant, constant trust in Him, our faith. The word trust has more impact to me. You know, if you were to go to somebody and say, do you have faith in me? They could say yes. But if you ask, do you trust me? That means something different, doesn't it? It puts, it, it takes it out of the realm of intellectual assent and put it, puts it into the act of confidence and action. So, as we close this morning, do you have eternal life? In the scripture that we read, it says, he who has the Son has life. So the question is not do you have eternal life. The question is, have you accepted the Son? These internal evidences help answer that question for us, don't they? And he who has the Son 
has the life. And I used this illustration, I think, earlier this summer, maybe last summer. Let's, let's say that this little pointer represents eternal life. Now, John says that life is in the sun, so let's let the Bible represent the sun. So, the life, the eternal life, is in the sun. Right? So how do I get eternal life? By receiving the Son. Because when he who has the Son has the Son, then he has eternal life. So maybe the devil has been throwing, has been snookering some of us by having us constantly harp and question and wonder about whether or not I have eternal life and I'm going to heaven when I die. Maybe the question is, have I accepted the Son as my Savior? And when I have, then all the other questions are answered, including the one that I have eternal life. Does that make sense at all? Now next week we're going to look at uh, one or two of the other characteristics, external, paternal, or fraternal. But Paul, or John, makes this very, very clear. He says, my little children, I have written these things to you so that you can know. So that you can know that you have eternal life. And see, it has nothing to do with whether you're a Presbyterian or a Catholic or a Lutheran or a Baptist. You know, my family grew up with a lot of different denominational backgrounds represented in them, one more dominant than the other. But I didn't get my relationship with God for my denomination. I got it from my Heavenly Father. When I accepted His Son as a boy, He not only forgave me of my sins, He not only gave me heaven when I die, pie in the sky by and by, but he gave me eternal life. So that whoever believes in him, as Jesus himself said, will never perish. Who will have everlasting life. I don't know. I've studied a lot of different religions, having lived in Eastern Europe and traveled in many, many areas of the world where different religions are practiced. And as I've studied and tried to compare all these different religions that we talked about some last year, I don't know of anything that even re remotely comes close to the message that God loves the world so much that He gave His only Son. That whoever believes in it will never perish but have eternal life. So that's why we sing songs like Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchased of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. Isn't that amazing? Talk about amazing grace. John Newton really knew, didn't he? Let's pray. Father, we've taken extra time this morning, but I thank you so much for your word. And I thank you especially for your Holy Spirit, who is such an incredible teacher to reveal to us the truths of your word, oftentimes in spite of our stumbling and verbal blunders and lack of understanding. But when you told us that the Son of God came to seek and save the lost, you meant us. And we thank you that you loved us that much. I pray that if there's anyone this morning who's been struggling with doubts and uncertainties, that you let them know clearly whether they have eternal life because they've accepted you or whether they don't. And that your Holy Spirit will make that clear. We pray all of this now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Trish is going to come and lead us in a song. I, it's based on a scripture and a statement that Paul made, I think, in 2 Corinthians, if I recall. Where Paul says, I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded, I'm convinced that he's able to keep what I've committed to him against that day. So uh, as Trish uh, leads us in singing, stand up and uh, sing with us.